begin. Amen. <clears throat> All right, this will be Lesson 5 in the Nature of God. And if you'd open your Bibles with me tonight to the book of Romans, we're going to read just quickly the first verse in Romans chapter 1, and then we're going to move on down uh, and begin in the 16th verse and read through to the end of the chapter. But Romans chapter 1, first of all, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Now, uh, you know, normally we talk in terms of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think more, more in terms of the gospel being related to the name Jesus Christ. But uh, here Paul talks about he's been separated to the gospel of God or to the good news of God. And this isn't an entirely strange statement for him to make because uh, he makes it again. He talks about the gospel of God in 2 Corinthians 11, 7, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2, 8, and 9, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. And Peter also uses the uh, term the gospel of God uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. And so, uh, and, and I think hopefully what we've learned so far is that really the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that, uh, that, that he is revealing to us, I should say, the goodness of God, the good news of God himself. Jesus has said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, we've talked about that. And so the gospel of God really is what Jesus came to, uh, to expose us to. Uh, with that in mind, though, let's go on down to the 16th verse. Uh, where, be, where he immediately begins talking about the gospel of Christ. But I want to read this passage down through the 32nd verse. It's a long passage, but we're going to uh, get into this tonight. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, in what? In the gospel that he's talking about. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed. Now, I want you to realize that he's still talking about the gospel. In verse 17, he said, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And in verse 18, he's saying the same thing in effect. He's saying, for in it, in what? In the gospel, the wrath of God is revealed. And before we go on any further, I want you to kind of notice there that he is uh, actually making an association between the good news and wrath. Now, we'll, that'll become a little more clear to you a little bit later on tonight. But, uh, see, we have a tendency to kind of uh, shift gears when we go from a word like gospel to a word like wrath in just a couple of verses. But I want you to see he's still talking about the gospel. He says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And then in verse 18, he's saying, implied, for in it the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Now let me make one other little addition here, a comment here before we go on. The word that's translated Godhead here is the same word from the Greek that we have seen in Acts 17:28, where it said, and the divine nature should not be interpreted. And it goes on and talks about the art or the thought of man. And over in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, it talks about how we are partakers of the divine nature. So we're going to just plug that in because in those two passages, in the New King James anyway, this word Godhead is translated the divine nature. So it says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divine nature, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves." who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 
For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And from those couple of verses, first of all, we've determined, religion has determined for us, that that, uh, Paul had a bone to pick with the homosexual community in Rome. And uh, we have seen and heard many, many messages, I'm sure, in your lifetime, you know, out of this first chapter of Rome, Romans, and as though th- that were uh, Paul's whole intent was to bring uh, the disgrace of homosexuality into full view, whatever. But that's not at all what this passage is about. We're going to see that tonight. He does mention it, obviously, but let's go on and see if he doesn't mention some other things that are maybe a little closer to home for us straight folks. <laughs> Want to make sure you know I'm straight. No, I'm not right. <laughs> Let me see. Um, Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality. Now listen to some of these things. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Man, he's just nailed off. All of us, right? So apparently this passage of Scripture is not just about sexual perversion or sexual abnormality, okay? It's about something different than all that because he's really covered the whole gamut of, uh, of human frailty and failure based on the whole concept that he's presenting here. So, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things, all these things that were mentioned, see, are deserving of death not only do do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Anyway, we're going to con- conclude this uh, line of thought right here, but actually we could go on into the second chapter, uh, and, and we probably should at some point in time. But for tonight, I, w- I just want to talk about uh, this presentation that he makes here in this first chapter of Romans, because normally now we go back to verses 16 and 17, and we have a, uh, have a tendency to kind of deal with them separately or independently, you know. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith and so on. And we know that portion, that's the portion that we often lift out of there and use independently without regard for verses 18 to 32. But here's what we need to realize. These entire 17 verses from 16 through 32 uh, all together are intended to unveil to us, you know, the power of God to heal, to deliver, to protect, to preserve, to provide for. This is all about the revelation of the gospel, and uh, we need to really put this all together in one context instead of breaking it up. And, uh, and, and, th- and thinking that Paul suddenly changed his thought after verse 17, and now it's all about making sure that we all understand, you know, about the depravity of human sexuality and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, but let's talk a little bit. Let me just read you this out of Mark chapter 1, because uh, it, it says, refer- re- referring to Jesus' ministry over here, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Or he came preaching the good news of the reign. That's what that word kingdom means. The reign of God. Jesus came preaching the good news of the reign of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God or the reign of God is at hand. Repent. What's that mean? Think differently and believe in the good news. In the good news of what? In the good news of God. So this is what we learned in in Mark chapter 1. We've talked about it several times in the past. We're told that the beginning of the gospel, because that's what Mark 1, 1 begins with, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All right? Those are its first words. And we're told that the beginning of the gospel was the preaching of the good news of the reign of God and a call for us to think differently and believe the good news about God himself. In other words, to a people that were full of terror and and fearful expectations with regard to their God and how he might deal with them. And uh, sadly, there are still many people in the church today that have that same sense of terror and fear of God. 
and it ought not to be that way. But here's these people that Jesus is, is uh, first ministering to. And to this people, you know, Jesus came demonstrating a new revelation of a good kingdom. He came demonstrating a kind and a benevolent rule, didn't he? That's what he was all about, revealing the Father. We've been talking about that for several lessons now. And, of course, the ultimate expression or the ultimate demonstration uh, of, this, of this good reign, of this, of this uh, benevolent Father, was the sacrifice of himself for all of mankind, wasn't it? That was the, that was the ultimate expression, you know, of the goodness uh, of God. And so, now, in effect, Jesus declared and we've already talked about some of this, but in effect, Jesus declared to us, uh, to all of mankind, that he was the truth about the Father. Now, we're all familiar with the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but as we've looked at it a little more, uh, in, in a little greater context, we realize that what he was really saying was, you know, I am the truth about the Father. I'm the truth of the Father. When you see me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one, see? And so he, he, he said to us, in effect, I'm saying that I am the truth about the Father. I am the truth of the Father, you might say. And also that the abundant life is in the understanding of the truth about our Father's nature. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. But he made it very clear throughout all these teachings, all these things. You know, uh, one lesson we spent just going through all of the, the statements that were made pre pre predominantly in the book of John where Jesus made himself and the Father one in his, in his declaration, declared that they were, in fact, one. And so everything about Jesus is a revelation of the Father. When he said, I am the truth, he's saying, I'm the truth of the Father. So when you look at me, you're seeing the Father. In other words, I'm the truth about the Father. So you can no longer have these de de uh, carry around these deceived ideas about who the Father is if you're going to see me because you're going to have to understand that I am the Father in your midst. And so he's also telling us, you know, that this abundant life that he's come to give us is really discovered in and experienced in a, in a clear and true revelation of who the Father really is. And this is important because a lot of us have known the Scripture, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, and yet we haven't experienced much of the abundant life. And part of the reason for that being, is, as I've been saying now for the several lessons, is that because we've been carrying around on our shoulders, to use Isaiah's terminology, an, an image you know, a false image of God. Of course, he was referring to him carrying it this way and taking it from place to place. But we need to understand that we've been carrying it around up here in our head, false images of God that cannot answer or deliver us from our troubles, is what uh, Isaiah said. And so we haven't experienced the abundant life. And because ac across the broad scope of the body of Christ, I'm going to tell you still today, the majority of truly, you know, confessing Christians still are carrying about a false image of God to one degree or another. Now, none of us are perfect in our understanding and our revelation of God, no question about that. But false images really speak contrary to the nature of God. None of us necessarily have a full revelation of the true nature of God, but what I'm talking about here is, is us carrying around, as we have so often, false images or images that are contrary, that speak you know, in opposition to the true nature of God. Right? Okay, so <clears throat> anyway, but uh, as I said, you know, the, the abundant life is, 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 is in the understanding of the truth about the Father's nature. Now, I said this because I want you to understand that Paul is pursuing the same line of thought here, that, that it's the, uh, he's talking about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. And what does salvation mean? Healing, deliverance, freedom. You know, preservation, protection, those words that sozo and soteria mean. Um, anyway, so, and, and so what he's going on to do down here in this chapter is he's going about the business of, of, of showing us how the truth releases the gospel to be operative in our life. And, and, and uh, we'll get on with that. So let, let's go to verse 18, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Let's start there now. As, he, as I said now, he says, for, and I'm going to go ahead and put in my implied understanding here, for in the gospel, in the good news, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, as I said, Paul's following the same line of thought that Jesus is, that a revelation of the truth 
will enable you to experience that abundant life that Jesus came and provided. That a revelation of the truth about the Father's nature will open up to you a whole world of experience that maybe you've never known before. And so he's following that same line. And so he says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so what truth is he referring to? In other words, what particular truth was suppressed inciting, as it says here, God's wrath? Okay? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. But first of all, I want you to notice that it says that his wrath was against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. Now, please notice that it didn't say that his wrath was against ungodly and unrighteous men. It said, but the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. And there is a definite distinction there, and it's important that we understand that as we go. But what's that mean? His wrath is revealed against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. Well, we need to remember that that religion will tell you that ungodliness and unrighteousness have to do with the things you do, right? Why, he's just living in an ungodly way. That was an unrighteous thing for you to do. Isn't that right? So religion has communicated to us that ungodliness and unrighteousness have to do with the things we do. Well, you know, if that's the case, then certainly the things we do would be the target of this thing called God's wrath, which we actually mistakenly interpret as God's anger. That would be if. If, in fact, ungodliness and unrighteousness have to do with the things we do, then, in fact, God's wrath, according to this verse, would be directed against, <laughs> you know, uh, the things we do. The tar- the tar- uh, those things would be the target of God's wrath. But that's not what he said. And then, consequently, the focus of this chapter, you know, would have to be those evil activities that we read about down there in verses 29 through 32. You know, let, let me read those again to you one more time. It would be just to kind of remind you. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. We don't need to read them all. But you see, if ungodliness and unrighteousness that he's referring to in verse 18 were referring to the things we do, then in fact the wrath of God, which we call the anger of God erroneously, then it would in fact be directed at, at those acts, wouldn't it? All right? But here's the thing. That's not what's being said here. And, of course, before those acts, we'd, we uh, stumbled across the, uh, the homosexual lesbian uh, conversation that, uh, that many of us have, have, have experienced with, you know, in churches and in the preaching of Romans chapter 1 before. And, and let me say this quickly because you know, it was not at all uncommon for Paul uh, to use a dominant behavioral abnormality in a community that he was ministering to to try to help these people understand how they got that way. The real root here is is Paul helping these people understand how they became embroiled in all of these things that he has spoken of with regard to you know wickedness and so on and so forth. In other words, Paul's focus was not on the deeds. His focus was on what it was that caused man to become that way. Does that make sense to you? See what I'm saying? And, and because we've had such harsh interpretations you know, of Scripture, because we've had a, a judicial God set before us, because we've had a legalistic mentality and a law mentality preached in the church for so long, we go immediately in our mind to the deed. And we make comparative judgments based on the deed. See, and whatever that deed happens to be and however we happen to feel about certain things, you know, certain things bother some people more than they bother others. And so we build our doctrines and our, and our you know, judgments around those things. But anyway, I want you to understand, and you'll see this more as we go tonight, that Paul was not about exposing people's deeds. What he's about doing is showing people how behavioral abnormality came to be. Because keep in mind, Adam and Eve were not created with any behavioral abnormalities, were they? And they were in this fellowship until that moment in, uh, in time when uh, Genesis 3, 6, and 7 came along there. But they were in this fellowship with, with, the, with the Father himself. And so there was no abnormal behavior going on there. There was no you know, uh, improper behavior going on there. So it, it wasn't something that just 
popped up either the day they sinned, that all this thing just became, you know, active in the world. All these things that we just read about, they just all suddenly happened, came right out of a jack-in-the-box, and there they were. See, these things developed over a period of time in people, and that's what he's trying to show us, how man de- degraded himself and became in, uh, captured by all these behavioral abnormalities. And if we can understand this, it'll help us be more gracious and understanding you know, towards others and, more importantly, maybe towards yourself because so often we judge ourselves so harshly uh, you know, because we all recognize, I mean, as I said, you get down in that 29th through the 32nd verse and you just can hardly, can hardly avoid finding yourself in there somewhere. You can close your eyes, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil kind of thing, you know, like that. Plug your ears and, and maybe not hear me say it. And if you don't follow along in your Bible, maybe not read it. And therefore, you can hopefully, you know, in your own mind, exclude yourself from any involvement in those verses. But the truth of the matter is he nailed everybody here in this passage of Scripture, right? Okay. All right. (coughs) Excuse me. But the truth that's in reference here, when he talks about, in verse 18, talks about who suppressed the truth in unrighteousness, the, the truth is, is in reference here uh, will become here in the next couple of minutes very, very clear to you, very plain to you if you'll just follow along. We're going to follow along here and uh, follow the flow. There's a flow through here that we commonly miss because, as I said before, we've been so trained to look for the deed, the deed that stands in a position of ungodliness and unrighteousness, you know, all right? So we're going we're gonna to follow the flow because what Paul's doing here, he's revealing the truth that really uh, actuates the power of God in man's lives so that they can experience this salvation, this deliverance, this health, this wholeness, this soundness that he has for us. All right, so you just follow. I'm just going to read a little piece out of certain verses here so that you can catch the flow because this is the flow. This is what Paul really is talking about. And all this surrounding material is really peripheral to it. So notice, first of all, in verse 19, he says, because. All right. (coughs) Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Notice that he says, what may be known of God. He's not asking a question here. He's making a statement. But he starts off with this. What may be known of God. What's he talking about? Knowing God, isn't it? He's talking about having an intimate relationship with God, all right? And then he goes down in verse 20, and he says, okay, we've already read what may be known of God. And then in verse 20, he says, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. What may be known of God? And then he talks about it. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. Or as I said, this version says Godhead, but it means divine nature. And then if you go down to verse 21, notice here it says, although they knew God. He's still talking about knowing God. What may be known of God? I'll tell you what may be known of God. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. And although they knew God, go to verse 23. In verse 23 it says, they, excuse me, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God. Who changed? They changed. They changed God. Now, did that mean that God altered his attributes? No, it means they altered in their own imagination and understanding God. They changed God. See? It would be like, well, let me read one more. In verse 25, then, it says, they, referring to the same they, which is humanity that he was talking about here, not just Adam and Eve, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. For what lie? For the lie about who God really is, Right? Now, this is a twofold thing, and I want you to get this, and you have to listen to me carefully as we go through this because we're going to do the same thing with ungodliness and unrighteousness. We're going to show that it's two sided here. Okay? One coin, two sides, same coin. All right? So it says they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And I say, first of all, I see the references they exchanged the truth of God for the lie about who God was, right? And you can see that in the conversation that took place in the garden. You know, has God said? And, of course, the implication is that God hasn't really been, been forthright and open with you. God has not, not told you everything you really need to know. So basically, God is kind of a deceiver. God is kind of, uh, you know, a liar. He hasn't really told you the truth. I mean, has God said, you know, if you eat or touch that tree, you'll surely die, right? I mean, so, so there's, there's, a, there's that being 
uh, being communicated. But here's another thing you need to get out of that. They exchanged the truth of God, referring to the fact that they re- exchanged the truth of the fact that they were of God, that they were in the image of God, or as the psalmist and Jesus both said, I said, ye are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Uh, Psalm 82, 6, and I believe it's John 10, 34. I said, you are gods. In other words, declaring to us the classification of being that we are as a result of whose offspring we are, right? So this is a double-sided thing. They exchanged the truth of who they were, right? And they exchanged the truth of God for a, a lie about who God was. Both of those things took place. You can see that happen in the garden, obviously, okay? So, but notice that now these two words are closely associated. Verse 23, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Now, they're both coming from the same root word in the Greek, but the reason that the translators use two separate words is because in the first one, when it says they changed the glory of the incorruptible God, what it means is that's like changing the color of something. Like I have a red shirt and I change it and dye it blue. But exchange means I have a red shirt, but I take it back to Macy's and I exchange it for a blue shirt. In other words, one is changing the other is exchanging, see? And that's what they did, first of all. They changed in their own mind. They dyed God a different color, you might say. And I'm going to make reference to that in just a moment out of, out of Baxter Kruger's book here. But anyway, so they changed the glory. What does glory mean? It means, uh, it means the view and the opinion of God. So we could put it here. They exchanged their own view and opinion of, of, of God, you know, of the incorruptible God. And then it said in verse 25 that they, let's go back to verse 25 now, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and served the creature rather than the creator. The word creature here literally means formation or fabrication. And so here's what it says. In other words, they served the fabrication of their own imagination rather than the creator, the true God. They exchanged, see what I'm saying? They exchanged the truth of God for the lie about who God was, and they began to serve the fabrication of their own imagination rather than the true God, rather than who God... Now, listen, this is, this is all well and good and easy to dismiss if all we're thinking about is the, is the Adam and Eve of antiquity. But when we realize that this is something that is very real, a very real experience in the lives of Christians still today, and certainly if it's real in the lives of Christians, it's real in the lives of those people to whom we're supposed to be reflecting the glory of God. But all we're reflecting is those two verses maybe that, that, that uh, condemn homosexuality and lesbianism. Maybe that's all we're reflecting to the world. Who wants any part of that? No wonder they go on down and says they become haters of God. Why wouldn't they become haters of God when we present a God like that, see? <clears throat> All right, in verse 28 it said, <clears throat> they did not retain, I'm going to leave, I'm, I'm taking a few words out just for the simplicity of it, but it said, they did not retain God in their knowledge. It's referring to their accurate discernment and their understanding. They did not retain God in their accurate discernment and understanding. Again, what's that mean? That means they distorted. Now, listen to this out of Baxter Kruger's book, uh, Jesus and the Undoing of Adam, a book I highly recommend, by the way. But listen to this thing he said here. Adam's pain inevitably altered his understanding and the way he saw himself, his world, and others. But most importantly, it altered the way he saw God. Adam projected his own brokenness, as it were, onto God's face. He tarred God's face with the brush of his own angst, which terrorized him even further and doomed him to deeper and deeper misinterpretation of the very heart of God. God did not change. God remained the same as always, faithful, determined to bless, right and true, overflowing in love and fellowship as Father, Son, and Spirit. But Adam had changed. And he, saw, and he now projected his pain, his anxiety, onto God, thereby creating a mythological deity, uh, a legendary God. And standing before this mythological God, this projection, 
Adam could feel only the most dreadful fear, for he believed himself to be standing before a God who is a hair's breadth away from anger, judgment, and utter rejection. See, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm talking about. That's what happened. That's what Romans chapter 1 is talking about. That's what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking to these people about, you know, why it is the gospel is not being effective in their lives and what it will take for them to, for the gospel to become effective in their lives. You're going to have to rid yourself of false images. You're going to have to allow the revelation of Jesus Christ as the revelation of the Father to become your indwelling belief about who the Father is. Okay? All right, then, now with the understanding, you know, that, that it's the nature of God that's the subject of Paul's message, because that's what I wanted you to get out of that. This whole subject of what he's dealing with is the nature of God, helping these people understand how man uh, became so depraved in his experiences, how his behavior became so, so distorted and so abnormal. It was because of what? Because they changed the glory of God. They changed or exchanged the truth of God. In other words, what did they do? They began to have a false image of the true nature of God. They began to misunderstand God. All right? So with that understanding that it's the nature of God that's the subject of Paul's message, then the things we do, you see, are being notated at the end simply <laughs> to show us the end of a wrong perception of our Father. That's what he's saying. These things have come about because we haven't had a proper perception of the Father. And you see, so what do people feel like? What did Jesus talk about? I think we talked about it in one less. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. See, what's the communication? The communication is humanity was running around with an orphan mentality. What do orphans do? Orphans, orphans have to fend for themselves. They have to find something here and find something there and do this and steal and rob and, and whatever is necessary, lie, cheat, in order to pr make provision for themselves for their, for their sense of who they are. Isn't that right? I mean, that's just one example. But, but I'm, I'm saying, see, that what he's saying here is that, that you need to realize, ladies and gentlemen, of Rome, he was saying, and then to us, of course, he's saying all of these things that we're so quick to judge and so, so quick to turn our backs on certain people, you know, I want you to understand that these things all came about because these people, because we have not had a proper revelation of who God is. And so you, church, must develop this understanding, must, must receive this understanding as delivered to us by the Lord Jesus and begin to reflect that glory into the, into the world. But first of all, you can't be standing in judgment of others because, and I'm going to add these last three verses to this so that you will understand that I've got all of you <laughs> captured by this. You see what I'm saying? Is this making sense to you? Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, now look at verse 28 again. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their, in their knowledge, even as they did not like to maintain you know, a, 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 an accurate discernment and understanding of God, it says, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, those things which are not tailor-made to their being. You know what I'm saying? That's what not fitting means. Isn't that right? Something that fits is tailor-made to your being. And God said, there are things that are tailor-made to the, to, to, the, to the high state of my sons and be, of being. You know what I'm saying? But it said God turned them over because they didn't retain God in their knowledge. Now, again, that's two-sided. They did not retain the accurate knowledge of God himself in their knowledge, and they did not retain the knowledge that they were gods in the image of God, the very offspring of God. See what I'm saying? They didn't retain that in their knowledge. When they didn't retain that in their knowledge, it said earlier that they began to... Let me read you what it said earlier. It said, they, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And when we read that, we think, you know, we only think that, well, that refers to, you know, the manufacturing of the golden calf and the, and the variety of actual uh, idols that they built. But really, the deeper truth is that what he's saying is when it says they, ex they changed the glory of the incorruptible God. Remember, they were crowned with glory and honor. Remember that? They changed the glory 
that they were crowned with of, of, the, of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. In other words, listen, this is how evolution had its roots. They began to see themselves as the highest form of the animal kingdom, not in the image of God any longer. They changed, they changed that, see? And they began to see themselves as a part of the animal kingdom. And so evolution had its roots back then. It's not, it's not some new phenomenon, you know, since, uh, what's his face, Darwin came along. All right. <clears throat> so I said, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. But I want you to see that God gave them over to a debased mind. Well, what is a debased mind? You know, I've said around here many times, and I know that there's another definition. Uh, it'll, 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 it'll feed off of what I'm going to say here. But, you know, I've told you before that any time we say a, see a re or a d, de or an re, we need to realize that there's a comparison, a contrast being made between something that was and something that is. Like when we, re, when we read the word redeemed. Well, we know that in the beginning man was deemed, Right? Deemed to, to have rulership of the earth. He was deemed to be Lord of the earth. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. Let them have dominion. God was, man was deemed to be God's rulers upon this earth. Okay? That's one way. And then, and, and then obviously we can go the other direction too. So let's go the other direction with it on this because it said he turned them over to a debased mind. What is a debased mind? It's a mind that lost its base. Right? It's a mind that lost its base or, its, or the foundational truth from which to make appropriate choices in life. Gave them over to a debased mind. See, the, the, the mind that has the proper foundation of truth, see, can make the appropriate choices in life. Isn't that right? But a debased mind can no longer make the appropriate choices. So once again, what's Paul doing? He's saying these people that you're judging in your community, that you're looking upon the despicable nature of their sexual involvements and so on and so forth. He said you need to understand these people are operating from a debased mind, from a mind that has been, been made void, you know, has lost its foundation, its truth with regard to who they are. And therefore, you see, they can no longer make appropriate choices. You getting this? See, that's what a debased mind is. Uh, we used to talk about debased. If you look it up in the dictionary, it talks about to, to, to lower in value, to lower in esteem. And really, that's what man did. He lowered himself in his own mind, right? Okay. <clears throat> well, the base, of, the base of truth is in, uh, in, or the base of the truth that's in question is clearly, in this passage of Scripture, the accurate understanding of the Father's person in nature. And apart from that, he, Paul's telling us, we will do those things which are not fitting. There's no getting around it, boys and girls. We are going to do those things which are not tailor-made to our being if we don't understand. Remember, I told you before, you cannot know yourself without knowing God, your true self. You can have an idea of who you are, but that idea will be distorted. You cannot know your true self without knowing God who he truly is, without knowing the Father, who he truly is, see? So that's what he's saying here, without a true and accurate revelation of God. And again, we're not talking about a full, complete understanding. None of us have that yet except the Lord Jesus himself. And I believe we're all on a pathway to a greater and greater revelation. But, any t but, but I'm still talking about just eliminating those things that are contrary to the true nature of God, Right? In other words, my children, as they grew up in my home, they didn't have a, 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 the degree of revelation about me and about their mother that they have now as adults. But you know what? If somebody had come along and told my children when they were young, there were a lot of things they didn't know about me. But if they'd have come along and said to my kids, you know, your, your daddy is unfaithful to your mother. He's running around with another woman. woman. All my children would have known to throw that out. See what I'm saying? They didn't have a full revelation to me, but they knew what wasn't true about me. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what I'm saying is I keep talking about having an accurate understanding of God. <clears throat> so as I said, apart from that, you know, we, we will do those things that are not fitting. For instance, in verse 24, what's he said? Notice in verse 24, he says that God gave him up to uncleanness 
in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Now, again, because of the way we've been taught this passage of Scripture, uncleanness immediately jumps out at us as the perversion of these sexual activities that the homosexual and lesbian community participate in. And yet, can you remember, please, what it was that the lepers were, in, were required to say as they walked through town? Unclean, unclean. They weren't professing to be sex perverts. They weren't confessing to be, you know, abnormal, have, a, have an abnormal sexuality going for them. See, unclean. And so he said, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. Things that dirty the natural man. Things that, that, uh, that, that, that foul, so to speak, foul the, the environment of natural man. Because man wasn't created in a foul environment. Man wasn't created in an unclean environment, so to speak. All right, so he says, in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And again, very few times is the word lust in the New Testament used to suggest sexual lust. But again, religion has captivated us, you know, and, and then has captured us with that idea. But lust just means the, the desires, the, you know, of the heart, right? Okay. So it says in the desires, in the lust of our hearts, it says we dishonor our body among ourselves. Now listen, you've you got to get this. Now don't take any condemnation from this, but here's the point he's saying. We dishonor our bodies with sickness. Our bodies were not created to be sick, right? We dishonor our bodies with sickness. He's saying, well, how did that come about? He said that came about... You know, as a result of the de of debased mind no longer recognizing, you know, the high quality and the high status of your being as the very sons of God. And therefore, you began to allow yourself to see yourself as a, as a member of the animal kingdom. And you began to live like animals with the expectations of animals and so on and so forth. All right, so we dishonor our bodies with sickness, with addictions, with bitterness, with, with unforgiveness, with premature death. I mean, you could go on and on and on because, first of all, the word bodies doesn't just mean, it definitely does mean the physical body, but it doesn't just mean that. It means all of your natural environment, everything that pertains to your natural environment. So we dishonor, you know, I often say our earth, you know. We dishonor our earth or that which is our sphere of influence and authority. We dishonor it. And, and we need to realize, again, what am I doing? I'm not trying to pick on us for being sick or addicted or, or bitter or unforgiving or anything like that. I'm trying to get us to realize in this passage that Paul is saying these things are all the results of having an improper revelation of who Father is. See, I, I, I had an opportunity to counsel with two different ladies from two different parts of the country uh, on, on the phone today with regard to understand. I mean, both of them calling for, for, for help with physical issues, and, and they, they've been listening to our website and, and, and watching the church a little bit here on Sundays and stuff. And, and with both of them, the, the only thing that I could talk about was their understanding of who the Father is, their understanding of the Father's love. Because you see, I know that when we really become, get to become or get to the point where we not only know but believe in God's love for us, everything changes. And you can't believe in God's love for you as long as you have a, as, as Baxter put it, a tarred face of God that you're looking at all the time. If God's face reflects your pain, you know your angst, as he said, if if if, if what you've done is imp superimpose on God what you believe about yourself, there will never be health and, and, and freedom from addiction and, and freedom from bitterness. And, and You know what I'm saying? Because those things are all a result of a false image of God. That makes sense? Okay. <clears throat> so it's important. The revelation of his true nature in you, and that's what Paul's talking about, heals and makes you whole. For I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ... For in it, the power of God is revealed. See? For it is the power of God unto salvation, unto healing, deliverance, protection, preservation, you know, deliverance, whatever. In it, in the good news. And we're talking really about the gospel of God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ revealing to us the good news of God, the good news of the Father. Because he's the one we didn't know. No man had ever seen, perceived, or understood God at any time but the only begotten Son who was in the bosom of the Father or who was heart-to-heart -heart with the Father. He has revealed him. 
say. So it was God we needed to get to know. And the only way we could get to know God was through the good news presented to us by Jesus Christ. So it's the gospel of God that really is Paul's focus, you know. (laughs) But Jesus Christ is the revelation of the good news of God. And so they're one and the same, no question about it. But I want us not to to, uh, to just understand that. All right, so, so the things that we do wasn't what Paul was emphasizing back in verse 18. So let's go back to verse 18 again. Hopefully you understand that now. Hopefully, you, hopefully you're beginning to understand that what Paul's real focus was was helping people realize how they got, how humanity got into the condition it was in. Okay? All right, go back to verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Okay, we've said that it's not about the things we do, it's about something else. Well, the word ungodliness means ungodlikeness. That ought to give you a big hint, right? All right, so again, we're going to deal with a two-sided coin, a single coin, but two expressions. First of all, Paul's first point is that God's wrath was, was stirred against the ungodlike qualities that had been attributed to him by men who had lost the understanding of their own godlikeness. See what I'm saying? What was he concerned with? The fact that because man had lost his own sense of godlikeness, that he was now, to use Baxter's words again, tarring the father's face (laughs) with with attributes and and, uh, concepts of nature that were ungodlike. He said, I'm God. I'll decide what's God-like. See? We're not referring now to all these mythological gods because remember in Adam's day there were no mythological gods. There was but one God. Mythological gods came about as a result of the ongoing ungod-likeness association that each man carried with him. Okay? And he began to create his own gods. Okay? So, (coughs) excuse me. So let me say this again. Paul's first point then, because he says, uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodlikeness. So the first point is that God's wrath was was revealed against or stirred up against the ungodlike qualities attributed to him by man who had already lost the understanding of his own godlikeness. See, double-sided coin. Remember, this is what Jesus Christ was all about. Revealing both, wasn't he? I said, you are gods, right? He called you sons and so on and so forth. All right. And then secondly, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, it says, unrighteousness. That means uh, the wrath of God was stirred up by the maligning, now listen to me, of his relationally intimate desires towards man. Again, (laughs) the result of man's own sense of distance and separation. Now, let me explain that. I've said this around here many times, but I know that very few people have actually caught it. Now, we have gone through many, many years of hearing about righteousness, most of us have, to some degree or another, and the word righteousness has often been described for us or defined for us as right standing with God. It's also defined as innocence. And both of these are very good definitions or expressions of righteousness. Okay? They're both acceptable, I want to say that. But I want you to understand, right standing is based on what? What you do? No, who you are. So right, the, the very root of righteousness is relationship, relational intimacy. Right standing is being in relational intimacy. Now, you've heard me tell this story, most of you have before. My oldest son decided when he was about 15 years old that he was no longer my son. Now, how, have you, how, how many of you realize that's absurd? He's my son, right? My DNA is in him, and there's nothing he can do about that. He can't have a DNA transplant and change his name and have it all go away, can he? Right? So he decided he was not my son. So he lived out away from me, right? But he's still my son, right? But there was a desire in my heart for relational intimacy with him. See what I'm saying? So... For him to be in right standing with me was not for him to be living out there on the streets of Fort Collins when he was 15 years old. I still loved him, still prayed for him every day, still drove by him when I saw him on the street. I'd wave, and he'd give me the finger wave right back. <laughs> you know, that was his way of greeting me. You know, I guess that was what he was. I was Hi, Dad. You're number one? <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> 
but, but anyway, there's the thing. You know, he, 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 right standing meant that he was in relational intimacy with me. See what I'm saying? Okay? And, and of course, and, and so this is what I want you to understand, that when it talks about the unrighteousness of men that suppress the truth and unrighteousness, what he's really talking about here again is that his own desire for relational intimacy with man was being undermined in the story that man had about distance and separation from God. The very thing that, uh, well, one of the very things that we've heard so many times taught about the, 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 in the prodigal, in the teaching of the prodigal, right? He's a son, right? He's out here, but he's still a son. And he, and he thinks he's a servant, at best, but he's still a son, right? The father's desire is always for relational intimacy with his son, but his son's out here. He's not really in a place of right standing, even though the father loves him with his whole heart. That making sense to you? And so, again, I want you to get this because we have such a, as I said, we've had such an indoctrination in the fact that ungodliness and unrighteousness, you know, are such a, or have to do with the things we do. Even the passage of Scripture that we often quote around here out of Titus where it says, The grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to do what? To deny ungodliness. I can't remember if it says and unrighteousness, but ungodliness, and live soberly and righteously in this present age. What's he saying? Deny every suggestion that you are not like God. That's what the grace of God instructs us to do. Don't allow the law to come along and tell you that you're not the, you're not the son of God, I mean that you're not like God because of the way you're living. See? That's what the grace of God does. It instructs us. In fact, let me go over there. It's Titus 2.11, I believe. Let's look at that because you need to... You need to understand this because I know there's a lot of people using this about how the grace of God comes along and really, in effect, they're saying, teaches us to, to obey the law, to deny ungodliness and all that. See? <laughs> Teaching us, verse 12, well, well, verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, right, denying every suggestion that we are not like God, right? And consequently, the worldly lust. What have we been worried, re reading about in Romans chapter 1? How any time that we accept the idea that we are not like God, worldly lusts take over, don't they? He said in denying every, tempt every uh, suggestion that you are ungodlike, and then, consequently, the, the, the worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously. What's he mean? Live in relational intimacy with the Father. Live there. And godly. Live like gods in this present age. Not in the wrong sense of God. You understand what I'm saying, right? But see, so this is what he's talking about here. He's saying the wrath of God, I mean, this is what ticked God off. He wasn't ticked off at man. He was ticked off the fact that man no longer realized he was his, you know, precious son, that he was his offspring, that he, that he was in, in, in his image. He wasn't the highest form of the animal kingdom. He wasn't, you know, uh, distanced and separated from God. Man thought he was, but there was no distance and separation there. God said, no, I want you to understand that I am re my desire is to be relationally intimate, right? So this is what, what he was, uh, what, what is telling us here, the gospel <laughs> is the revelation that the wrath of God was... Now, wait till we get into this next one. That the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against. Jesus hung on that cross as an expression, say, of the fact that God was sick and tired, if you want to say it that way, of man not knowing who he was, of not knowing how much God loved him and wanted to be a part of his every moment life, wanted to be relationally intimate. That's what the cross is about. Okay. <clears throat> so it was, it was the wrongful assumptions that were made concerning God's passion for his man. See, man had decided that God was passionate about man, you know, you know uh, uh, adhering to laws and guidelines and sacrifices and offerings. Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, right? 
But man believes that that's what God was passionate about in his life. But God was passionate about one thing and one thing only, and that was the heart of his children, right? And consequently, the welfare of his children. What does he say? I mean, you know, God wasn't silent in the Old Testament. I know the plans that I have for you. Or one version said, the thoughts that I think towards you, Jeremiah 20, 11, pl- 29, 11, plans for good and not for evil, or plans for welfare and not for calamity, depending on how you, which version you're using, to give you a future and a hope. For I have loved you, he says in, ver- in Jeremiah, with an everlasting love. See, God had a passion for the heart of his children. That's all he was passionate about. He wasn't a passion about guidelines and laws and sacrifice and offerings. That was the last thing. He said, I've had enough of the blood flowing through the streets of the sacrifices. I'm paraphrasing. He said, I've had enough of that. That means nothing to me. That's not what I want. See? What I want is for you to be redeemed from the attitude of ungodlikeness and separation and distance. And so I'm going to provide that thing, see? All right, now, so let's get into this for a minute. <clears throat> now, some of you will know this and some of you won't, so it'll be good, okay? The Greek word that we've translated wrath is orge, O-R-G-E, okay? That's the word orge. And literally, this word orge means to desire. Now, listen to this carefully. This is the word that the translators, the translators were presented with this word, orge, And out of it, they gave us wrath. Now, wrath has its own meaning, the English word wrath. But I want you to understand that this isn't going to work. These two are not going to work together, or gay and wrath. However, the Bible has consistently tried to make it work, and so men's hearts are confused. The word or gay means to desire, to reach out, or to pursue in excitement. It means violent or turbulent passion, which religion will try to turn that word violent into something negative. It means to stretch oneself towards, right? It means to long for. It means to covenant or to covet after. Now, as I thought about this this afternoon, I thought every one of those things is a a statement of, of of the way I feel about my wife and have felt for nearly 40 years. I mean, I want you to get this. This is very important. You know, you know, I desire her. I have pursued her with excitement. I reach out in excitement. I, we've had turbulent passion. We, I stretch, we stretch towards one another. We long for her. I covet after her. You see what I'm saying? That's what that word orge means in the Greek. All right? Now, since there are no children in the room, I'll go ahead. Okay? Both orgy and orgasm are the words that are derived directly from this word orge, and neither of those words creates a vision of anger in my mind. Only passion, extreme passion. Isn't that right? Turbulent passion, violent passion, if you want to. Excitement. Isn't that right? I'm not thinking that way right now, ladies and gentlemen. I just want you to know. But, But if you let those words sink in and you realize this is, what the, this is what the translators got and this is what they gave us. Now, let me give you one quick example. You know, you need to get my series on what about the judgment of God and listen to that. But let me give you one example. I think it's John 3, 36. It said, it said he that believeth uh, is saved or something. He that believeth not, the wrath of God abideth on him. I can't remember. I should read it directly so I don't confuse the thing here. This is just one. I really like this one, because, but you can, you can uh, really see this in almost every statement. Oh, John 3.18. He that believes in him... No, that's not the right one. Wait a minute here. I'll find it. Oh, well, I guess I don't know where it is. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, what's that say? The hot, passionate pursuit of God abides on him. The one who believes in the Son of God already has taken possession of the experience of everlasting life. But he that has not believed in the Son of God, you need to know something, children. He's saying, I'm never going to quit pursuing you. My hot, passionate pursuit is for you. I want you. I desire you. I covet you. Get it? 
And there are several others we could go through, but I don't want to because that's a different series altogether. But I want you to get this. So the wrath or the passion of God is to have his man know him as he is. So that man can be empowered into freedom and dominion and, and to the, the, the sense of unbroken fellowship, of intimate relational uh, communication with the Father. See, and that's what produced the revelation of himself in Jesus Christ was that wrath. It was the wrath of God that was revealed in Jesus Christ on the cross, right? See, it was the hot, passionate pursuit of man. It was God's passion to undo the deception of ungodlikeness and, and unrighteousness or distance and separation. That was the passion of the Father. And so it was that passion, you know, that produced the revelation of himself in Jesus Christ, expressing himself even to the point of death in the place of his children. So, see, that's wrath. <laughs> that's hot passion. That's love. That's goodness. Get it? Good. That also tells us that God's wrath wasn't directed at the things men did, right? See, now when you begin to see wrath in a different, uh, different perspective, you realize that the wrath of God certainly was not revealed against the things man did. God was passionate for the things we did in hot pursuit of the things we did that were not good. See what I'm saying? It's totally contradictory, actually, to use that word or gay with, reg with regard to the things that men did that were undesirable. Doesn't make any sense. See what I'm saying? But his wrath was... <laughs> You know, directed at the ideas that suppressed the revelation of who he is. His passion was to reach into the ideologies, into the mindset, into the thinking patterns of man through Jesus Christ and completely reverse what man thought about himself and what man thought about God. Isn't that amazing? Boy, have we twisted some things, right? So his, his passion was expended in Christ to show us himself. Just a couple of more quick scriptures and we're just about through. Now go to Acts 14. Are you getting anything out of this? Now I'll give you a little bit of background. There was a man who had been healed in Lystra and uh, you know in the 8th verse and and then you know they they healed him and and then uh, the people began to call Paul uh, Zeus and Barnabas Hermes and 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 you know they were worshiping them as gods uh, but when the verse 14 but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this they tore their clothes ran in among the multitude crying out and saying men why are you doing these things we also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness or testimony in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now let's look at this. Here's what it says. It says that in spite of men walking in their own ways, look at this, right? Verse 16 said, In bygone generations he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness. Here's what this says. It says, In spite of men walking in their own ways, nevertheless. You know what nevertheless means? It means more and more. More and more he did good. That's what it's telling us here. In spite of men walking in their own ways, more and more God did good. What's that tell you? That tells you he was pursuing them. The wrath of God was upon them, as the English translators would say. He was in hot, passionate pursuit of them. And how is he pursuing them? By doing good. Not by doing the evil things that they had attributed to him, but by doing good, right? Right? In that, in verse 15, he talked about, first of all, he talked about the living God. He said, um, the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all, them, uh, and all things that are in them. The living God, what's he doing here? He's, he's de developing a contrast for them. Living God is the declaration that all other images are dead in both their influence and their abilities, Right? That's why he's saying to these people, talking about the living God, the God who has influence, the God who has ability, not your gods. But again, 
the God maybe you and I are carrying on our shoulder. Is he the living God? Is he a God whose, whose, whose uh, presence really has influence and really exercises ability in our life? Or is he just a God of our own imagination? A false God. A God who cannot answer nor deliver us from our troubles. See? Not that it's just all about deliverance, but it is about answering. God wants to communicate, you know, right? So the living God, it says, going on down here, the living God does good in spite of our walk. I'm kind of summarizing this, right? And he, he does good in spite of our walk to do what? To fill our hearts, notice that, with, with food and gladness. See, the living God does good. Nevertheless, more and more, even as we walk in our own ways, he does good. Now, wait a minute, because the church talks about all the time that if you're walking out away from God, you can expect negative circumstances. You can expect bad things to happen to you because you're out of the will of God, right? But Paul said right here <laughs> that even in bygone days, the goodness of God, wouldn't you think the goodness of God would be more accentuated even now than in, in the old days? Of course it is, with his children as opposed to those who were not <laughs> associating with him. Of course, Lee, the good of, the, of course it is. The goodness of God is more accentuated, more wonderful today even than it was allowed, able to be back then. He said, in spite of us, the living God, in spite of us walking in our own ways, <laughs> more and more does good in order to fill our hearts with food and gladness. Now, obviously, food <laughs> isn't in reference to groceries because what you eat doesn't go directly to your heart. Some of it affects your heart, I guess. doesn't go directly to your heart. It goes to your stomach, right? But this word certainly does mean nourishment. The word he uses, uh, food. But it means fatness and pampering. So listen to this. In other words, here's what it's saying. His own witness of himself. Remember it said he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good. Gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. What he's saying here that his own witness of himself is that he pampers our hearts with nourishment that produces gladness. Now, there's a revelation of God that everybody needs to have. He pampers my heart <laughs> with the nourishment that produces gladness, not sadness. Not disciplinary, you know, sadness like people have tried to communicate. All right, so what is that pampering nourishment? Well, let's conclude with Hebrews 13, 9. And probably all of you in here know this one, but because I've been here a lot. And it's one of my favorite scriptures because it has so helped me <laughs> relate to some of the things of our, of our past and, and understand things now. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart, that the heart, right? That's what he provides food for our hearts to produce gladness, right? The good that the heart be established, that word means based or founded, by grace. Grace. Hmm. That's the pampering nourishment. This is what God pampers us with, his grace. Isn't that right? It's good that the heart be established. That word means based, not debased, but based. See? Brought back again to having a rightful base of operation, a rightful foundation of truth from which to make appropriate choices in life, for one thing. And the appropriate choices being more emphasized in the Scripture by Paul as the choice to believe that I am, <laughs> you know, in the image of God. The choice to believe that I am in right relationship with God. Hear what I'm saying? See, we thought Paul's emphasis was on the choice to, to, to quit being a homosexual or the choice to quit being this or the choice to quit being that. But that's not what it's all about at all, right? So it's, and, and then he says, no, notice what he says, not with nourishment, I'm going to say that, which does not profit those who are occupied with them. See that in that ninth verse? Be established by grace, not with foods or nourishment, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We've all had our seasons in the law. We've all had our moments or seasons in the law. How many of us realize that our seasons in the law, there was no nourishment? It did not profit those who were, how do you say, who were uh, occupied with them. 
There was no prophet during all the time we were occupied with the law. Isn't that right? We've, we've, we've come out of it now to see that really that was just kind of a vain time in our experience. Isn't that right? So he's talking about junk food doctrines, isn't he? Talking about junk food doctrines, right? He's, he's talking about all those things that Caleb doesn't eat. <laughs> no. Talking about junk food doctrines concerning the characteristics of God. And there are many junk food doctrines out there concerning the characteristics of God. Amen? So the power of God to salvation is found in the true revelation of your Father. And in a true revelation of your Father, you will begin to, as I always say, effortlessly experience the abundant life. Because you see, the only time we're, that, that we feel the need to put any work into it is when we have a false impression of God. Because what do we know? He's called us to rest, not to work. Amen? Amen. Praise God.